William, will you open us in prayer tonight? I, I always go by Bill, but I think you never oh, know. Bill, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> I don't know who that William guy is. <laughs> your Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your great love and for your willingness to uh, spend so much time with us when, when, when nobody else can. But Lord, uh, you're always with us. You guide us, you direct us, and we like to enjoy this time together studying your word. So reveal what your intent is to our hearts and our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, mm -hmm. Albert, we'll let you take it away, my friend. Well, thank you. And hello again to everybody. Our title, our lesson tonight is on humility. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but people have often said, I'm a humble person. And they quickly add, and I have a lot to be humble about. So, <laughs> so um, with that, um, what is the definition of humility? What, what comes to mind when you think of humility? Unassuming. Have, unassuming? Okay, good. Take, Pardon? Take, I was going to say, taking a step back from the spotlight. Stepping back from the spotlight? Okay. Didn't Paul say that Jesus humbled himself even to the point of the cross? He did. He did. See, I was just going to use the, the uh, dictionary definition here says the state or quality of being humble. Well, that's a big help. And it's <laughs> absence of pride or self-assertion, which I think is kind of the same thing that, that everybody said tonight. And there's one in our, our book here by John Wesley who says, humility, a right judgment of ourselves, cleanses our minds from those high conceits of our own perfections from that undue opinion of our own abilities and attainments, which are the genuine fruit of a corrupted nature. So I, I like that, a right judgment of ourselves. Um, so I think all, all of these ones that we mentioned, I think are good to keep in mind as, we, as our study tonight in humility. And let me read to you what the, our lesson says in the need. It says, are you humble? That is a hard question to answer. If you say that you are humble, even if you are, you appear to be proud. If you say you are not humble, then you in essence are saying that you, that you are proud, which may or may not be the truth. Humility is really a self-defining term. Its judgment is on a sliding scale from lack of self-confidence to an attitude of modesty that is not impressed with opulence or status. The strange thing about this self-judgment is that it is often unrealized. Neither is the self-assessment necessarily in agreement with the evaluation that others may have. Humility is the ability to be without pride or arrogance. Why is humility important to the Christian? God gives grace to the humble. It was one of the distinguishing characteristics of Jesus and therefore is something that we wish to emulate. And then the story says, meals in Jesus' day as described in Luke 14 were normally reserved for those of the same social status. The fact that Jesus was invited to a meal by the ruler of the Pharisees suggests Jesus was accepted as an equal socially. Reciprocity was expected in their culture as well. To be invited meant that you should return the invitation. It is evident that Jesus could not return the favor, so his presence must have been of special importance to the host. Luke gave a peek at what took place during these meals. Everyone watched everyone else, whether it was washing before eating, um, what was done or not done at the meal, who was or was not invited, where people sat or were seated, who ate with whom, or the rank that was established in the seating order. So with that, we begin the, the first part here, the, the par first parable that Jesus talks about. So let us begin. Okay, let me uh, share the screen with you guys. Hopefully this will work. And we have the same background as last week, but it's pretty cool. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. You guys see that? Yes. yes. Good. Okay, great. All righty. So let us start with uh, 
Brother Bill, please, if you would read the first verse. Way a little proud. And he began speaking the parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, Jesus had been invited on a Sabbath day to share a meal at the home of a chief Pharisee. He observed that some of the guests, concerned about their social position, were choosing the special seats of honor for themselves. Jesus decided to tell a parable that would help his fellow guests to understand the appropriateness of humility. And eight. And eight. Uh, Margarito, please. And when, uh, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. While the invitation to attend a wedding and be part of the marriage feast would be a distinct honor, the guest should not assume that he surely must be the most honorable person invited and find for himself, as it were, a seat next to the bride and groom. The guest may unhappily discover that the host had different ideas about who was most honorable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Alfredo, verse uh, 9, please. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. <laughs> How foolish it is to assume our importance, to imagine that we are worthy of honorable positions, to intrude into matters and places beyond our status and abilities, only to discover that pride goeth before a fall. The lowest place would have been the only one left. What embarrassment, what remorseful chagrin is ours when others have to put us in our place. Pride eventually springs the trap door on itself. So thoughts or comments? Certainly different than what the world says, right? Yeah, it is different. And, and when I hear this parable, the first part always reminds me when I probably was in college, I don't know, somewhere along the way, you know, I studying history or hearing the news, they always said that in the White House, um, that the, the person with the office closest to the president, it was a big deal for people because whoever's office was closest to the president meant they had that much more power and prestige because their office was closer. I mean, it's, it's just a symbol. And, and even in the Congress, um, the people with the, you know, been there the longest and have the higher ranks, have the bigger and more prestigious offices. And that's what this always made me think of. Of course, I wasn't in the working world and didn't you know, know about politics and, and how that stuff worked. But it seems that this is nothing, this is nothing new. Jesus was talking about it here um, in his time, and it's still the same. People you know, judge by you know, seating arrangements and office positions and, and all these you know, really not important uh, things that that, uh, that that the world places value on and and yeah like you say Harv um, it's sure different what Jesus is saying here well especially in the business world if you're uh, if you want your business to succeed you don't go out there and say oh well I'm the worst or the lowest guy you shouldn't hire me you know I mean <laughs> Businesses always say, well, this is why we're better than other people. Yeah, yeah, you don't see, there was a, I forget the movie, but Dudley Moore was in a movie and he was in, in advertising and he had this epiphany where he, he had to be honest about everything and he got the account for Volvo cars and this is year, years ago and so his slogan for Volvos was boxy but good. They're boxy but good, yeah. crazy people. Yeah, was that the, was the name of the movie? movie? Crazy people. The, yeah, I don't remember the name of the movie, but that 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 line always cracked me up because that's kind of how they were. I mean, they were boxy looking, but but everybody valued the, their safety and, and and what a good car they were. So, <laughs> but yeah, you don't see a lot of advertisements like that. They went to uh, the the insane asylum and got their 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 thoughts on the advertising. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a funny movie. Yeah. It was funny. Anyway, well, let's continue. The way of the humble. So who is next? Uh, Larry, did you read yet? No. Could you read, please? Number 10? Sure. 
but when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Humility is its own honor. A truly great man is as comfortable in the lowly room as in the exalted one. Greatness and humility, greatness and humility assumes that others are worthy of more honor than oneself. It would be an honor to be invited to sit in the reserved seat at the head table. True greatness will not need to wait long for recognition. Abilities and talents coupled with a great soul, excuse me, coupled with a great soul will make room for a man. Truly great men are noted not so much for the company they keep, but for the company that keeps them. It is an honor to be invited to share as an equal in the presence of great men. Even so, humility must go before exaltation. And 11. Uh, Noel, number 11, please. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. It is a law written into the moral framework of life that self-exaltation ultimately will be brought down. Again, there is a moral law that guarantees the ultimate exaltation of the humble man. It is far better to nurture in ourselves a humble self-respect than to nurture a proud self-esteem. And 12. And 12, Denise, please. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. Yeah. Humility applies to the host as well as the guest. Jesus described humility in action. How interesting to prepare a great meal and see to it that no one here mentioned was invited. He showed that true humility is not self-seeking, but selfless in its generosity. Humility does not give in order to get, but rather get, gets to give. And 13. And 13. Uh, I'll read 13. I haven't read yet. Okay. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. What an interesting guest list. These people represent those who are the most needy and would have the greatest appreciation of our generosity. It should be noted that it was with such as these that Jesus spent most of his days because they needed him the most. True humility has a heart for the lowly and hurting. Those who have wealth have an obligation to help the helpless. And 14. And 14, Brother William, please. Okay. Oh, Bill, sorry. And you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus' life was lived around the principle that is more blessed to give than to receive. Humility in action is its own reward. A supreme internal warmth of happiness floods the heart of the one who gives selflessly to make others supremely happy. By saying and doing things, selflessly giving to others, especially when there is little chance of earthly reward, we bring ourselves into God's debt and set ourselves up for eternal payment to be begun at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, so what, what say you? I don't believe we ever put ourselves in God's debt, but okay. Pardon me? I said, I don't believe we ever put ourselves in God's debt. Okay. Or God owes us anything. <laughs> Is that what it's saying? Um, I didn't read it that way. But maybe I didn't look at it that way. Um, yeah, because because you're right. He doesn't owe us anything. But I guess but I guess that by the same token, it's saying that um, that that will be a reward. I guess the example of humbleness is that uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit came to us to love us, to show us His love, and to lay down His very life for us. You know, that, that's, that's I mean, yeah, yeah, that you can't get much better than that. As, as I was reading this lesson, I was thinking of a, 
of Harvey, what Harvey says often about uh, C.S. Lewis, that uh, Jesus coming to be a human was like uh, us becoming a slug. <laughs> Is that if that good? <laughs> if that if that good, there, yeah. Other thoughts or comments? So Jesus is telling us in the first part about the pr the proud and the prideful who were you know looking for for recognition and and um, and, and how the humble behave. It's better to it's better to set at the the bad end of the table and be asked to set at the good end rather than vice versa. You know, um, I mean, what do you think of that? That's what happens at a big Thanksgiving dinner when you're the kid. You sit at the big table and they say, uh-uh, you guys go to the kid's table. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I always liked the kid's table, though, because that's where the other kids were. So that was okay. Each table is the best table. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> doesn't matter if you spill at the kids table that's right no. <laughs> speaking of thanksgiving dinner i mean what about a verse 12 was it verse 12 there that tells us to you know who to invite so at thanksgiving are you not going to invite your family but invite invite all the other people that it says to invite here wow <laughs> well i think you have to put this in the uh in the uh light of what it was written and where it was written and, and the community in which it was written to, you know. Yeah. But I think the key here is um, when you go to a meeting, you better to keep your mouth shut and listen to the others first, you know. Yeah, what, what do they say, whether it's a class or a meeting or something, there's one in every, there's one in every group, there's always someone who, you know, seems to like to hear the sound of their voice more than anybody else's and and i like what you say there bill you know it's a good idea to go and listen and see what you know others have to say too before you just you know tell the world how important you are and and, and your opinion i'm not sure i agree with some of the notes here at the beginning of this where it said that they thought jesus was the same stature so they invited him this is luke 14 he's already well immersed in his ministry and they were just trying to trip them up, I believe. They would often bring people in, you know, like the guy that had edema, and say, mm -hmm. is he going to heal him on the Sabbath? Let's get him. Let's yeah. get him. Let's visit. So I think they were trying to trap Jesus. Yeah, I tend to, to go along with that more so than, you know, he's their buddy. And that's the way they make it sound, you know, he's one of them. Although, you know, I, I suppose it could be that too, but but well, yeah, it seems like most of the stories we hear are more like what, you, what you're talking yeah, about. Well, well, it doesn't say it was the Pharisee Nicodemus, so I'm going to say, uh-uh. <laughs> he was yeah. the only one who really liked him. Yeah. And there, there was something else, I don't know if it's in these notes or the next ones too. I, I'm not sure that I um, agree with the author's interpretation, but I, I don't see what it is right now. But for the most part, I, I mean, this is a good parable. I mean, talks about, you know, the, the, the proud and the humble. I mean, what does it teach us about humility? Um, you know, does, does the humble person really care where they sit? I mean, I guess it's a nice honor to be called from the end of the table to the front of the table. You know, anybody likes that recognition. But I think someone who has their values straight, it doesn't really matter that much to them. I mean, where as to someone who is, you know, doesn't show the right attitude of humility, um, like the the parable says, to, to get knocked down, you know, to the you know the end of the table, the kids' table, whatever you want to call it, that would really be pretty devastating to them. Whereas the truly humble person is like, yeah, I'll sit wherever you want me to sit. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, no. Yeah, agree. Okay. And then what the, the verse there on verse 11, um, because this is, there's different scripture that says, you know, pretty much the same thing for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Bible speaks about that, that concept, you know, in different places, not just here. Um, that, that's kind of a, a, a recurring theme in the Bible. 
um, you know, God expects us to, to recognize where our, our gifts come from. It's from him, not from, not from our own doing. Yep. All right. Well, let us continue. Okay, uh, Luke uh, 18, number, verse 9, right? Denise, would you read that, please? And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. This parable was told especially for the benefit of the Pharisees. They were confident within themselves that they were acceptable to God but their arrogant self-righteousness caused them to hold others in contempt. Okay. And uh, Margarito, verse uh, 10, please. 1810. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Pharisees were a sect among the Jews that was small, but respectable, powerful, and proud. Their righteousness consisted of details of religious observances, but neglected matters of the heart. Publicans were Jewish collectors of taxes for the hated Roman government and were looked on by society as the lowest class, along with pagans in general. Their occupation was usually associated with corruption and extortion, knowing the Pharisees' self-conceit and their great aversion to publicans. Jesus contrasted them in this parable. Okay, and Larry, verse uh, 11, please. Oops, sorry. There you go. The, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. <laughs> the focus of the Pharisee's prayer was not on God, but on himself. His prayer went no farther than his own ears. Since it was self-congratulatory, he, not God, got the most enjoyment out of it. God, I thank thee. It is possible to invoke the name of God in our prayers and conversation without truly engaging him in our hearts, that I am not as other men are. In this classic, holier-than-thou prayer, the Pharisee was thanking God for his superiority to others. Indeed, he had reason to be thankful that he was not involved in extortion, unrighteousness, and adultery. But such righteousness by comparison gains no favor with God. The disdain for the publican was apparent. We need not think that our worship is being accepted by God when, in fact, we are looking at others around us with a disdainful or critical eye. Nor will our pointed words in worship be honored by the Lord when they are meant for certain people to hear. And verse 12. And uh, Noel, could you read verse 12, please? I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. It was customary for the Pharisees to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays until 3 p.m. That they were also fastidious about paying tithes on their commodities, such as seeds, etc., as well as their income. These were fine and scriptural practices to follow, but they did not give the Pharisee bragging rights before God. It is a spiritual tragedy when the only relationship people have with God is what exists in their own imaginations. The Pharisee made the mistake of thinking that performance is relationship. Jesus told the story in such a way as to have the Pharisee using the word I five times. Spiritual pride is of the worst sort and is most odious to God. All right, comments. Here we have this Pharisee getting up there and, and offering this prayer and, um, you know, the part about, especially about, you know, I thank you that I'm not as other men and, and then lists the list there. I think uh, I have become uh, more conscious of the fact uh, since I've been here at Solheim that uh, in my prayer life, <clears throat> I never, um, I kept coming to God with a list of all the things that I, that I wanted or what I was praying about or what I was concerned about. And uh, I, 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 you know, and I, I began to realize it was time to, for me to shut up and listen to God and ask him, speak, you know, to have, invite him to do the speaking to me and, uh, and then just shut up. And um, I find that my prayer life is a lot more productive 
Good. Good. Yeah, Again, how often do we pray, uh, God, make me more like Jesus. I want to be more humble. Say that again, Harm. I'm sorry. And we pray, God, make me oh. more like Jesus. I want to yeah. be more humble. No. I like the term. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I like the term that you use um, often. You know, people think of God as a celestial Santa Claus. You know, gimme, gimme, gimme. Yeah. And and yeah, that's that's true. I think it's more important to just look at and enjoy God. You know, the flowers don't say a word. They just blossom and they lift up their leaves and in, in praise to God. Um, the plants, you know, the, the, uh, the big tree doesn't try and compete with the, uh, the small uh, uh, daffodil. Um, you know, each flower has, comes into, the, into a season of, of blessing for those that behold it and then they yeah. die. And uh, that compared to eternity, that starts our life cycle. We come into God's presence and, and it would be better if we could reflect what God does in our life. We should say, thank you more often. We should say, God bless you more often. We should listen to what the Holy Spirit would, would say to us so he can guide us throughout the day and even that moment. But it's, uh, it's, 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 I don't go to big meetings anymore. Uh, I used to. But, uh, um, you know, and they always used to give me a big table because I was a vice president or a president. And um, it, um, it was better to, to sit somewhere and listen. Listen to what my salespeople were doing. Listen to what the customer was saying. Hmm. That's very well said, Bill. Thank you for that. Yeah, I would just like to point out before we continue, it says in the King James, publican, not Republican. So that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's your political speech for the day. <laughs> that's it. No more. Okay. <laughs> so, so the Pharisee here, you know, he compares himself to, to, to all the others and 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 I and I do agree that that he's he's elevating himself over these people in, in this prayer. Um, you know, it's it's a prideful prayer. I, that's the way I would interpret this too. But have you ever said a prayer, or have you ever thought, well, well, it kind of goes to the expression there, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, you see someone who's. Um, lost or, or, or whose life is, is really turned out poorly. And you are grateful that your life isn't that way, that, you know, God has blessed you and, and that, you know, you're following his will mm -hmm. doing. Now, I don't think that's wrong. I don't think that's the same thing as what this Pharisee is saying, you know, to, to say, thank you, Lord, that I'm not, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, it, it depends on your heart and what you're saying. Are you saying, gee, I'm better than these people in God's eyes? No, you're not. But you're thankful that your life is in a better position and that God has blessed you. And you're, you're thankful. You know, Bill was saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I, I think you can say, you can kind of say somewhat the same thing coming from a completely different motive, I guess is my point. Yeah, it's either a heart of humility or a heart of pride. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I clearly think here the Pharisee is, is, is a heart of pride. Oh, he's yeah. Proud, proud in what, what he's done, not what God has done in his life. Yes. It's hard, what, hard to be, it's hard, hard to be prideful when you come into God's presence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good point. Denise, yeah, were you going to say something? Oh, go ahead, Dan. Oh, he's, saying, he's just saying, oh, look at me. Look how wonderful I am. Yeah. What he's saying. <laughs> Someone that doesn't, has no idea who God is. Because like you said, William, I mean, if, if they had any inkling of who God was, they wouldn't say that prayer. That's quote, unquote, prayer. Yeah. I was thinking that the opposite of, um, of this 
humility is, is pride and, and, and pride is the original sin there, the downfall of the angels, the, the downfall of Satan. Um, I, I, I use, I, I shared this verse before, but uh, it was uh, Proverbs 27, 2, uh, let another man's, let another man praise thee and not thy own mouth, a stranger and not thy own lips. You know, if, you, if you've done something good, you know what, it'll get out there. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to wear, uh, you know, a sign. Look how awesome I am, whatever. Um, and if you're not recognized, you're just doing your just, you know, your just duty. You know, you're not anybody, you know. It's nice to be recognized, but not self-recognition. And, oh, oh man, Nobody's, nobody, nobody appreciates me. And I they get on a pity party, and I think it just, it's a danger, you know. It's not just... Embarrassing, like those people that were, you know, took a good seat and then told, hey, go sit somewhere else. This is reserved for somebody uh, you know, else, you know. So I, I, you know, just tread softly. Good, good. Well, let's get to the publican here. Not Republican, but publican. <laughs> okay. Alfredo, could you read verse... Uh... What is it, 13 now, please? 13. Yeah. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Though the publican went to the temple to pray, he did not feel worthy to enter the usual area of worship, nor to associate with the worshipers there, whom he regarded as better than himself. How contrasting was the publican's attitude of unworthiness with the Pharisee's attitude of self-righteousness. The publican did not feel worthy to approach God. He was smitten in his heart with the weight of his great sinfulness. In grief and sorrow, he struck his chest and poured out his heart to God. In a prayer both simple and profound, he came with the right attitude, called on the right source, asked for the right help and benefit, and identified the right need and condition. And 14. And Margarita, would you end up with 14 for us, please, tonight? The tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. There's that, uh, that expression again. He who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. The notes say, the Pharisee left the temple as he came, proud, critical, and self-righteous. As he left, the inner warmth he felt was not the warmth of God's presence, but that of self-satisfied smugness. The publican left the temple a different man. He met God, and God met his need. Mercy had forgiven his sins, cleared his record, lifted his load, and sent him home a truly righteous man. Just as there are, and it, it lists that, that, that it, that um, verse there, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Just as there are inexorable laws written in nature, so there are invariable laws that govern the spiritual realm. These laws, which are governed by God, relate to individuals and govern not the attitudes and actions of men, but the effect of those attitudes and actions upon the individuals themselves. The self-exalted person will ultimately become the object of humiliation. The self-humbling person will ultimately become the object of honor and exaltation. All right, thoughts or comments? I guess it's a good thing they have name tags on all the seats in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of seem like uh, old school politicians. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I will say that uh, since, you know, Mr. Kruger passed away and I've assumed the role of pastor at Pillar of Fire, Highland Park Christian Church, it's been very humbling for me to be the one to prepare and get the messages ready for people on Sundays and uh, getting more into God's word. And I, I appreciate everybody's uh, 
uh, I guess, your support and uh, comments and uh, just keep me humble. That's all I'm saying. Okay, that's because because that's what happens when you know pastors or you know religious leaders they they start puffing themselves up and think that oh it's all about them and and that's when ministries fail and I I want it to be all about Jesus. Does this mean you want me to criticize you more? Not anymore, honey. Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I told I told you one time I was on vacation and I went to a congregational church and at the end of the sermon, the pastor said, "Well, it's our practice here to, um, you know, invite comments from, uh, you know, from everybody on on what they thought of today's service." I thought, "Boy, this is a brave a brave pastor," <laughs> and people commented honestly. I mean, it wasn't all just you know all glowing stuff. I mean, they were pretty straightforward about it, but. But Harvey, we we will keep you honest in that sense. But I think that uh, you know what you said. You know, keeping your eyes on Jesus and wanting to do His will that'll that'll keep you on the, the straight and narrow without our help. So that's a good thing. And, and that that girl that has the Dendi Harvest Bride, that's the one that keeps me doing that. Just so you know. There you go. Okay. There you go. The difficulty about being a pastor, and I can say this because I was a preacher's kid. Um, Pastors uh, have to live a life the way they preach it. And uh, that's pretty hard because uh, it's uh, God's word uh, itself. If we apply it to our lives, uh, it reminds us of all the failures that we have. We, we fail every day. Uh, and um, I don't mean to, 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 we should walk around with uh, sackcloth and ashes on us, but uh, the reality it is, the more we read God's word, the more we can say to ourselves, we have no right to ever puff ourselves up and think of ourselves any higher than we ought to think. And uh, it, uh, I've seen too many ministers um, uh, adopt a grandiose uh, method of um, of um, exalting the name of the Lord, and uh, I watch politicians also exalt themselves, and uh, it's shameful. It's shameful to see other countries observing our behavior and our attitudes, and how we condemn each other, and um, we uh, we uh, really. Uh, I'm, I'm back for, I'm, I'm of, of an opinion that we should only elect people to an office for a certain period of time and then they ought to quit and go back into society. <laughs> I agree. Uh, that that well, thing is called uh, term limits. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bill, you mentioned something about we shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Well, how highly ought we to think? Let me read something to you here. It says, it is clear that a humble spirit is something highly valued by God. That being so, what can you do to develop this aspect of your character? If your attempt is no more than an effort of self-improvement, you've missed the point and have failed to accomplish the original goal. And then as a discussion question says, how would you describe the balance between a positive self-image and a humble, honest self-appraisal? And so I think that's part of the struggle, you know, I, you know obviously, you're right, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. The Bible tells us that. Um, but remember in the opening comments, it said something about humility as a sliding scale. You know, how, how do we do that? Now, I'm not just asking you, I mean, I'm just throwing it open as a question. You ought to look at other people and uh, look at their, um, uh, look in some way that we can compliment them, uh, either for what they say or for the way they're wearing their clothes, or uh, uh, we, we need to greet people. You know, I experienced here at Solheim a whole new way of life that I never had before, and it's been very, uh, very humbling. I have people here that uh, are PhDs, doctors. Uh, we have one guy who is a Supreme Court judge, and um, it's 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 very very, very 
I consider it honorable and uh, very, very humble to, um, to approach them and say, good morning, how are you doing? Um, uh, you know, to, to, to put their, their feelings and their opinions and their, uh, their words ahead of your own. And, uh, and yet some of these people are grand people. But, mm -hmm. but, but I, I have people that are dying every day. Or not mm -hmm. quite every day, but, you know, each, each, at least once a month, we lose somebody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have a lady here who's 103 or 104, and uh, she's struggling. And she was, uh, she was president and uh, a doctor. And um, she's uh, a gracious lady, um, but she's she's not going to make it. You know, I I doubt if she'll make it in another month. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have this uh, judge here that was a uh, superior court judge. Uh, he, his degree was in criminal law, and uh, he's a very quiet man, a gracious man. And um, so when I greet him in the morning, I I say. Uh, you know, I, I you know I, I, I like to listen to him, and I, and it's, so it's it's given me a different experience in life. I no longer have to work and um, talk about how great I am. I'd rather listen to other people and have them tell me about their lives, and um, um, it's it's a wonderful experience. Good. Again, very humility comes with just having a servant's heart attitude. Like mm -hmm. when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want to serve people, that's that's the basis of humility, I believe. Mm -hmm. Good. Anyone else? How, how do you balance between, um, you know, low self-esteem and, 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 and being and having the right amount of uh, self-respect? Not not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but but not thinking too lowly of yourself where it's it's unhealthy too. I don't I don't think that's what this calls for. I like what C. S. Lewis says about humility. He says that being humble isn't about thinking of yourself less. It's about well, it's not thinking any less of yourself. It's about thinking of yourself less. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, it's it's not it's not about me. I'm just uh, one person trying to do my best, but I have confidence because I have Christ, the risen Savior, guidance watching over me. Yeah. Good. Well, I have something I'm going to read to you. That's in in um, in my book. It says. When we compare ourselves with God, we are obviously nothing, and we should quickly confess our helplessness. That was Job's situation in Job 42, 5, and 6. But when we stand in comparison with others, humility may express itself differently. Humility, to refer again to the quote from Wesley, is a right judgment of ourselves. It is possible to degrade ourselves in the name of humility, only to find that what we have done is to demean the gift that God has given us. If God has given us a gift, we must acknowledge it, all the while ensuring that the praise for the gift goes to the giver. I, I think that's an important part is, is, you know, whatever gifts we have, the praise goes to the giver. Um, and I also think, you know, what Bill was sharing about all the people that he's met there at Solheim, you know, and listening and learning from them, it's not taking away from from what, what, what Bill or any of us have to offer or what our gifts and skills are either. I mean, God has given those to us so we should recognize them and use them for him. But it's recognizing that, you know, we all have different, different abilities, different gifts. God has uh, endowed us all with uh, different things and, and, and we need to take that into account. God doesn't think any more of me than he does the next person, but he also doesn't think any more of the next person than he does me. He loves all of us. And, and so I think somewhere in there, there's a balance. We don't want to knock what God allows us to do and has given us the ability to do. By the same token, we want to look to others and edify what they can do as well. 
Good thoughts. All right. Well, if nobody has any other thoughts, um, or if you do, please, you know, jump in any time. But at this point, Harv, I'll turn it back over to you, or maybe I should say to Denise to read us the point of special interest. Oh, yeah, we'll let her do that first. Okay. A young missionary suffered much reviling and ostracism because of her labors among the untouchables, the lowest of all castes in India. One day, a man in great agony was brought to her. A large thorn had been driven like a nail into his foot, and only a small part of the offending object was visible. She had no surgical instruments with her, but seeing how he was suffering and not wanting to make him wait any longer for relief, she kneeled, clamped her teeth around the protruding thorn, and pulled it out. Oh, how could she put her clean, pure lips to my dirty foot, asked the grateful man. The next day, he and his wife accepted God's forgiveness through Jesus the Savior and became earnest, faithful workers for the Lord. They had seen humility in action. Her forgetfulness of self had demonstrated to them the wondrous grace of God. So anybody going to volunteer to to bite somebody's uh, nail out of their foot? <laughs> <laughs> You know, just one more story before, and Harv, I said back to you, but just one more story. Um, is last Sunday on the sports, the late sports, um, Fred Rogan, the, the sportscaster for Channel 4, had an interview with Vin Scully. Now, I know several of us here, if not all of us, just, you know, think the world of Vin Scully. And, I mean, he's widely regarded as the best baseball and, and sports broadcaster ever. Um, but yet he, he displays such a humble spirit in, in the, way he, the way he approaches things. And I don't think it's a false humility. I mean, I think that's really how he, he looks at himself and, and, and his ability. But Fred uh, was interviewing him and he was talking to him and he gets to the end of the conversation. And Fred says, um, you know, well, thank you, Vin, for uh, taking the time to be with us tonight. And he goes, oh, no, thank you, Fred. I mean, thank you for something to the effect of, you know, thank you for thinking of me and having me on your show. And I'm like, we could sit and listen to him all night long. And yet, you know, that's all he thinks of, you know, no, I appreciate you coming to me. It's, you know, just kind of a, kind of a amazing man as gifted as he is. And yet he's still, he's still humble and, and he honors God. I mean, he has walked that tightrope really well over the years, you know? Yeah, no, yeah, I don't, but, but I yeah. don't think it's an act. I don't think, I don't think it's an act at all. Mad, I think that's I mean, who he is. He knows who he is and he always says he just wanted to be a, a cheerleader on the side. Yeah. 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 All right. Definitely. Now it's too hard. I promise I'll shut up now. Okay. Well, if there's any no more comments here, I'll just go ahead and close in prayer. And then we'll keep the meeting open for anybody who wants to talk for a little bit, but we'll end this. So let's close out in prayer. Father, we thank you this evening, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, uh, that you sent Jesus Christ be the ultimate example of humility and also to be our pure and perfect sacrifice so that we could be right with you. Help us, Lord, to remember that although we don't puff ourselves up, we do know that Jesus didn't come for worthless mud. You value every one of us, Lord, equally, and it's a high value, a value so high you sent your son. So, Lord, we just ask that you help us to Remain humble in our lives. Help us to focus on you and bring others to you into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. If anybody wants to stay and talk, you may. I'll turn off the recording now because we don't get to see each other except here. Anyway, recording is stopped. <laughs>